Hello everybody and welcome to the Plant-Based Revolution Summit where a collection of the top paid plant-based entrepreneurs have been brought together to share with you how you can create a full-time income online in the vegan niche doing what you love. Even if you're coming from a place of zero technical experience and don't have any followers on social media yet. Here you'll learn exactly what these entrepreneurs sell, how they sell it, and how they've built their audiences so you can do the same for yourself. Today we've got John Venus. John Venus is probably one of, if not the biggest, Instagrammers and YouTubers as far as like body size and strength goes on this summit, <laughs> um, as well as like one of the biggest uh, plant-based entrepreneurs that I know as well. So very, very glad to have you on the summit, John. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me, man. This is going to be fun. Super, super fun. So as we were saying before the show started, like what you're doing, what we're doing here on the summit, what all the speakers are doing in the summit, uh, what we do for a living is something that a lot of people are aspiring to do. Like we would all love to be, you know, the next John Venus. We'd all love to be the next Doug Graham or the next, um, you know, Jamie Pounds with Daily Green, with whatever. We all, we would all love to do this for a living. And it's, uh, there's very few people actually willing to take the leap of faith and go for it. And, uh, you have an incredible come up story, man. And you posted it on your YouTube. You, I think when you hit a hundred thousand followers, maybe it was back in 2016 or something, you made a video about this talking about your come up story. Um, and you, you had a quote in that come up story uh, where you said, you know, when you see someone, actually, I think you said this in another video when you're talking about like re reaching your goals and you said, when you see someone who has something you want to have, it may seem very hard to get. And it may even seem impossible, but if you take the right steps and you dedicate yourself, you will make it eventually. Right. And, and, yeah, and, I think and, that was know, that video. Yeah. <laughs> and, and some people give a lot of lip service to that, but you lived it. And I want you just to briefly talk about like, what was your leap of faith like for those of you who, who don't know, or for the people watching who don't know? Yeah. So, I mean, in terms of uh, leaps, there were definitely uh, quite a few leaps uh, during, you know, the, the come up when I started uh, doing this thing um, and before as well, before when I decided to, you know, go to university or college to study film and any other like, you know, different things, even like playing soccer professionally. I just, just decided to play soccer when I was 18. So there's a diff like different moments of my life where I tried to go all in and uh, took a leap of faith into different things. But in terms of the social media side of things, uh, I think for me, it was more a case of um, feeling like it was a oversaturated market because at that point I was not vegan. Um, I was just a, a regular dude trying to do fitness on uh, Instagram and on YouTube. And even though it was, I started a long time ago, even then it was, you know, there was a lot of people uh, doing it and it felt really saturated, right? When in reality, it's always going to be saturated and it's always going to be space for someone to rise up no matter how many people are involved, right? Uh, your uniqueness is, uh, you know, is able to shine through if you put enough effort, right? Um, so for me, it was kind of just seeing uh, the possibility of, you know, doing something with my life that was unrelated to, uh, you know, having a boss, unrelated to waking up at a certain time that I didn't want to wake up uh, to, to not having to rely on taking orders from someone else. I've always been a really bad student and always got into trouble in school because I just can't follow orders. So I, I just like, you know, told myself and promised myself that I'll do whatever it takes to, you know, make something for myself without having to depend on anyone else to succeed. And that just, you know, it just took a lot of self-belief and starting from zero <laughs> and just, you know, going with it. And just even though I went years and years, uh, you know, super broke and without any success, I still just, you know, tried to have that belief in my head without, you know, deviating or, or just, you know, I just had blindfolds on all the time and eventually things happen, right? So, to, yeah, and, and, and to paint a clear picture for people you said, okay, I want to make this YouTube thing work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to work super hard for six months in this warehouse, packing boxes, writing forklifts. Yeah. And you save up six months worth of, of, of living expenses basically. And then you're like, okay, I'm going to quit the job. Now I have like six months worth saved up. I don't know how much that is. Maybe like 10, 20 grand or something, maybe less. Yeah. And then you're like, okay, now yeah. I'm going to move into a super small one room apartment <laughs> with my girlfriend. 
Yeah. Where, where the one room apartment, you can take the camera and you can film the entire house <laughs> in one shot, right? Yeah. And you're like, okay, I have six months to make it. The timer's on now, go. And you're just like, every day, you know, you, you had to create content. You had to be your best version of yourself for those six months. And were you yeah. able to successfully make it in those six months or did you have to go back working a job or do something else for money? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and, and even prior to that, I've been kind of on social media for a few years prior to that video that you're talking about, but that was the moment where I was like, you know, I have to give it my all because before it was more, I was, I was in college, I was doing other things at the same time and just playing around with it. But that was like the moment where I just decided, you know, I have to go all in. If this is going to work, I'm going to have to put my whole, you know, effort and intention into it. Right. Um, so funny story is that I didn't make it, you know, in terms of like, I didn't blow up on social media in those six months. I didn't, you know, get a huge following or anything like that, but I was so decided on eventually making it and allowing myself you know, as much time as needed, even though in my head, I, you know, said six months, I figured out different ways to extend that period uh, by generating income in different ways, right? So I wasn't generating any income for myself through social media, per se. Uh, what I did was I kind of freelanced um, for other fitness um, influencers online, I, I made videos for uh, the people at the top of their game uh, at that time. So People like Rob Riches, uh, Mark Fitz, Chris Jones, Alan Gabay, these fitness people that, you know, were really, um, you know, huge on social media. So I just kind of edited it for free for, for you know, uh, to them for a couple of weeks, months. And eventually I got to a point where they wanted my help consistently and I would get like 20 bucks or 40 bucks per video edit, which is pretty low. Like nowadays you have to pay hundreds per per video for fl freelancers because, you know, the market is, is crazy. But you know, that's how I started. I just, I, I took 20 bucks here, 20 bucks there and just tried to kind of, um, make it like that. So, you know, that kept me going for maybe another six to 12 months. And then, you know, eventually things started happening on, on the social media front. Wow. I love that, dude. I love that. That's so cool. How you're just like, you know what, like, I'm just going to do this for free to prove my value, yeah. to prove my worth. And if they see my value, if they see my worth, then they'll pay me. And then when, yeah, they did, for sure. it, when they did pay, it was like 20, you know, 30. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Amazing. And I was putting in hours of like the, the editing was crazy, man. Like, yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, so crazy. Um, Not how, thinking so about it now, it's did, like, did you even ask them if you could edit or you just, you just took their old clips and re-edited to make mashups or how did you do that? Uh, so I asked a few, uh, most of them would never reply because they probably get those messages all the time. So what I did instead of just, you know, waiting on someone else to help me out, I was, I would take their clips, go on YouTube and, you know, find the best clips and then match them together into motivational videos with voiceovers and, um, the best clips basically into one mashup. And then just to impress them with the editing skills that I didn't even, <laughs> that I had to learn as well through the whole <laughs> process. <laughs> and then they would hire me afterwards. I love it, man. That's so cool. So good. That's the grind, man. That's, that's the grind. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, John, for those who don't know, what exactly do you sell? Like, how do you make the money online? Uh, yeah, so there are many different streams that I currently make, uh, you know, money online. So there, there are the, the passive, not even passive, but I would say the more passive stuff is, uh, let's say, the AdSense, Google AdSense checks from YouTube, which are you know not very high at all maybe like 700 to 1500 bucks a month um and then um i have sponsorship money which is more passive right so i have sponsorships uh actually just one sponsorship you know from uh, supplement companies i don't really you know i i could have gotten more sponsorships here like for different brands and that kind of stuff but i find that um the more you have the more kind of tedious it becomes and the more responsibilities you have and the more you have to you know spend your influence online uh and instead of like you know uh you have to choose where you kind of push your audience towards right so i always try to keep as much of the uh things that i push my audience towards uh to things that i own myself right so i have sponsorships and then commissions from the uh the um products that i push from my sponsors which is you know between 10 and 20 percent depending on the company and then i also have um I have online coaching right now that is like high level coaching, which is something that I just started. Well, I, I've always had like a couple of clients just here and there who are just reaching out and really need that help. But uh, in terms of focusing on, on building a client base and actual big coaching business, I've, I've only started like four, 
last seven to eight weeks now. And then prior to that, um, and still doing uh, meal and workout plans that are customized to help people get in their best shapes uh, possible on a plant-based vegan diet. And that's something that I've kind of, that it's been kind of the, the biggest uh, earner for me throughout the, the last five years is definitely the meal and workout plans because, you know, it's customized, it's got, you know, amazing value. And there are not that many other options out there on the internet as well. So even without advertising, or Facebook ads or YouTube ads or anything like that, I've always been able to, uh, you know, generate a good enough amount of cash just from the meal plans and workout plans to survive and do what I want. So, and then everything else was just a bonus. Right. That's awesome, dude. I think it's important to have those multiple flows of income. It's very important. Yeah. And it's not something that we're taught growing up. We're taught growing up, hey, have a job. You have a nine to five. That's it. And then after the nine to five, when you retire, you get your pension. Right. But right, you're, yeah. you're like, I want to create like six, seven, eight, 10, 12 different sources of income. So they're all coming in. And then if like one's down, for example, I got the other 10 coming in. Right. So yeah, you yeah, always 100%. have money coming in. It's amazing. You don't really need to think about when's my next money is always coming in. So that's awesome. Um, John, as far as I, I know you made a video recently, I think it was your latest video called, you know, your top three biggest insecurities now. And those were like general insecurities about like maybe the way like maybe you used to look or something on your eye you said, which when you zoomed into your eye, I couldn't even see. I was like, what's he even talking about? <laughs> oh. Yeah, I, I struggle finding, a, finding the right light for that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure, you know, I, I mean, everyone has insecurities, right? And yeah. um, I'm sure insecurities change over time. Some things used to be insecure, but maybe not so insecure about anymore. But as far as uh, your business goes, what were some of your biggest insecurities when you first started out? Like now you're offering coaching, but maybe when you first started, you, you were insecure about being able to get people results with your coaching, right? What were some of those insecurities mm -hmm. that you overcame? Yeah, so I think my main insecurity was when it comes to business was always, um, you know, being too pushy to my audience, like, you know, being too salesy, asking for, you know, people to sign up to my meal plans and workout plans, coming across as a salesman rather than someone who's got, you know, genuine intentions and that kind of stuff. So this is something that a lot of people struggle with. And I wouldn't say I struggled with it a lot because, you know, I was always pushing the stuff, you know, consistently. But at the back of my mind, you know, while I was pushing it, I was always, you know, kind of uh, weary and, and kind of conscious about that, you know, to an extent because, you know, the, the ultimate thing for an influencer is the trust that you have with your audience and the people who are following your journey. And you want to do everything you can to preserve that. And a lot of people, myself included, uh, believe that if you sell too much, if you push them too much, then they might lose that trust and just think you're a snake oil salesman and, and just, you know, stop following you. Uh, which, you know, people do all the time. Like every time I mention uh, something, people do unsubscribe and unfollow. But uh, at the same time, many more people just come and, and stay, right? Because of the value that you're, you're kind of, you know, bringing to the table. So I kind of like to think of it as, um, you know, like your audience as a type of a currency, right? So you're, you're trying to, uh, instead of, you know, spending your influence, you're trying to, uh, you know, provide as much value as possible. So you want to provide more value than, than you spend your influence because every time you spend it, um, there are consequences, whether some people get pissed off and leave or, you know, uh, these people that actually buy don't get results and, and never buy anything again. So you have to kind of like, you know, be a little bit careful and not overdo it in terms of the uh, pushing your products and that kind of stuff. Um, but at the same time, I've always been way too cautious, which meant I've never made the kind of money uh, that I actually could have many, many years uh, you know, ago. And this is something that I've just come to terms with in the past, maybe, you know, a year or something like that, where I, I just like, you know, felt super comfortable pushing anything because I knew the value of it was worth it. And that is just something that a lot of people, uh, other influencers feel as well. They feel, you know, the uh, imposter syndrome. They feel like they, if they push something, if they charge more than 40 bucks, they're, they're, they're a sellout. And yeah, I mean, like, of course you have to, as long as you believe in your stuff, I don't think that you should ever sell yourself short and you should not be scared of pushing your stuff. And that is something that, um, you know, I have developed uh, recently for sure. And, you know, the fear of, you know, being a sellout has completely gone right now. So, yeah. Cool, cool. You mentioned uh, that, you know, you don't want to be always pushing, pushing, pushing. Instead, you want to be focusing on providing value. What does that mean, providing value? Like people give that, it's a buzzword these days, but what does that actually mean to you? 
Yeah, for me, it just means that you kind of, uh, you know, you're, you're providing information that can help someone in their journey in their life, whether that's, you know, nutrition, fitness, mindset, business tips, whatever it is, it doesn't even have to look a certain way. Everyone has their own way of, of trying to help someone else out, right? So just information that can be beneficial in any way uh, to improve other people's lives. That's how I see it, at least. I love it. I love it. I love it. And people get very, it's easy, it's easy for us to think, like, oh, I don't know what to say on Instagram or YouTube. But it's like, right. what information do you have that's helpful? Right? Yeah, exactly. And Yeah, and I mean, I, everyone has information, right? So, you know. <laughs> yeah, if you watch any one of, of your videos, you watch back any of your videos you're watching, you're like, wow, this is super helpful, super helpful, super helpful, super helpful. So you're like the king of like being super helpful. Um, yeah. And, and I. And it, it, uh, it's, I think it's helped you grow significantly faster than a lot of people out there who are just kind of not really providing that value. Instead, just maybe like just trying to sell stuff, like you said, or just trying to like yeah. show off or whatever. Um, so that's really 100%. key. Um, John, I think the, the yeah. intentions kind of show, like, you know, I think deep down people see through your intentions. So if your intention is truly only to make money and the influence is a side effect, I think, you know, I think maybe you can win on the short term, but uh, I don't think it will be a sustainable model. And I think people will see through that. So you kind of have to come to a place mentally where you want to, you know, at least equally influence as you want the, the reward and the money to come in. So it's really important to have both of those, um, you know, wants as well. Now, you mentioned too early in the interview, you said that, you know, these, when you started years ago, you saw the, the fitness market on YouTube, maybe even the vegan fitness market on YouTube was super saturated. Like there's so many people doing it, right? And so, and, and still you decide to go for it, right? Most people would say, oh, there's too many people out there doing it now. There, we got, you know, we got John Venus, we got Brian Turner, we got Nima Delgado, we got Derek Sinnett, we got blah, 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 yeah. right? Um, but you went for it anyway. Um, but what niche would you say you're in now? And has your niche changed over the years? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a really interesting question and always something that I keep asking myself because um, I feel like my niche has always been, uh, you know, health and fitness, right? And I try to, and, and you know, veganism tied into those uh, topics. And I feel like, you know, in, in the very beginning, like you said, I, it was super saturated, but it wasn't saturated with, uh, you know, vegan athletes. Actually, I, I couldn't find anyone online who was doing uh, that at the time uh, at all, at least on YouTube, right? Which was a platform I consumed content personally. Uh, I knew there was vegan gains and, you know, during Rider Freely, but I don't really consider them uh, fitness channels. So in terms of what I wanted to do was more bodybuilding type uh, videos on a vegan diet. And to be honest, no one else was doing it back then. But I started before that, right? I started uh, like in the actual, you know, meat uh, based uh, bodybuilding scene, which was completely oversaturated way more than the vegan space is now. Like I actually consider the vegan fitness space to be undersaturated. Like there is room for absolutely everyone. It's just about, you know, standing out, developing your talents and just, you know, putting in the work, I think. Um, but yeah, like I, I consider my genre right now to be just health in general, just a healthy lifestyle. And in terms of why I think I haven't been growing too much in the recent kind of year and a half, is because this genre is, you know, doesn't really exist on YouTube anymore in terms of like, you know, there are, there are no channels I can look to or doing similar things in terms of just a healthy lifestyle in general. At least I haven't found that many. Um, so like, you know, uh, what has happened is that I've kind of talked more and more about veganism and the benefits of, you know, uh, nutrition uh, on a plant-based diet. And that has, you know, brought my channel a lot, you know, closer to a niche, but at the same time, it's helped you know, people way more than ever before. So the impact has been a lot bigger, right? So I keep, you know, changing my, my kind of approach, trying to see, you know, am I going to go more in this direction? Am I going to go in this one? And I keep like experimenting with different videos and let, you know, let the results just show themselves. And then I'll adapt whenever I see something that is working out better. That's kind of how I approach it. You have leads perfectly into my next question. You're you have about six videos with over a million views. I think your most viewed video now is over three and a half million views, which is really, really cool. And, uh, you know, potentially in the future, all your videos are going to be getting over a million views. But at, at this point, um, you know, you have a few, like I said, six with over a million views that are far above the other videos. Do you sometimes go through your videos and sort by the highest viewed and then say like, look, that one did really well, that one did really well, that one did really well. I want to make more just like that. 
Or do you mm-hmm. instead just say, I just want to make what I feel like making and I want to forget about what's working. Yeah. What's worked in the past. Yeah, hundred percent. So uh, for me, it's always been a, a kind of a balance between the two, right? So I know that, you know, if I focused on meal prep videos when I was uh, kind of like seeing the results and how many views were coming in, I knew that if I continued making meal prep videos consistently, that I would, you know, have millions of subscribers and millions of views and that kind of stuff. But at the same time, I was like, do I want to be, you know, the meal prep guy? Do I want to, you know, just be making these videos that I actually hate making? So much work involved. Uh, and m- the answer was no. So even though I knew that this would, you know, lead to a much higher, you know, passive income in terms of, uh, you know, maybe uh, commissions from the protein powder showed in the meal prep videos and maybe even potentially meal plan and workout plan sales. I still, because it didn't feel good to me, I didn't feel like, you know, it was worth it. I, I just didn't do them as much as, you know, other people probably would if they saw that kind of momentum. Um, looking back, it probably would be a better idea just to keep doing them on a consistent basis, just because, you know, you can't just do what you like all the time. So that's kind of been one of the things that I've learned throughout the years. As I get older, I'm more willing to do things that I actually don't enjoy doing and, you know, grinding a little bit more. But for a long time, I was just, you know, focusing on, you know, living the best life that I could, enjoying myself uh, to the fullest with my family or, you know, before that with my girlfriend and just being a living the influencer life without any, you know, attachments, without ever feeling a a sense of, you know, that I'm doing something that I don't want to do. Um, But I've kind of changed my mindset on that a little bit lately um, because I do think that, you know, if you want to get to that next level, if you really want to, you know, do the big stuff, you have to do things that are outside of your comfort zone and things that you don't enjoy sometimes as well. That's wise, man. That's wise. Uh, what? So, so when people watch your YouTube videos, it's easy for them to just say like, oh, look, there's John on camera. There's John filming himself. There's John filming his food. But what they might not realize is that, the, or is this true? Do you do the editing as well? And if so, what is your workflow like from concept to filming to edit to upload? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I'm a very unorganized person, which is why like, uh, I've never had a schedule or anything like that. So I just pick up the camera, I film. When I'm done filming, I just edit. And I'm probably one of the faster edit- like fastest editors out there. I, because of, you know, I was working for so many people in the past freelancing, editing videos. I just, I just learned to you know, do it extremely fast. So um, you know, I probably, I could edit a vlog in, you know, 40 minutes or something like that or 30 minutes. It's really quick for me. Um, so yeah, I'll just decide one day what to film. Uh, if it's a topic video, I'll write down some bullet points, uh, what to talk about, what I want to touch on the important things I want to talk about. And then I sit down, I film it for maybe half an hour or something, edit it for another 45 minutes and then boom, I upload it. Um, well, like, and then maybe, you know, 20, 25 minutes on a thumbnail. And then, you know, the upload process and that kind of stuff. So I I try to, um, you know, do everything as efficiently as possible. So I don't feel like I'm actually working because I don't like, you know, I I enjoy editing. I don't, you know, dislike it at all. But at the same time, I want to have as much time doing other things that I could, you know, that I feel will enrich my life more than sitting down in front of the computer editing for hours. So, um, but yeah, I do everything myself in terms of the YouTube videos. I've never had an editor for YouTube or anything like that. Always done everything myself, the planning, the filming, and the editing has always been done uh, by me. I mean, Catherine, my wife, uh, does help with the filming sometimes as well. Cool. And a and couple questions there. What do, you, um, what do you use to film? Use your phone or use a DSLR? Yeah, so in the very beginning, I actually used a, a really crappy gro- uh, GoPro with the horrible audio quality. Um, <laughs> if you go back, you know, <laughs> back enough uh, in, in my YouTube, you can see how terrible the quality was. It's just like, you know, like 140p or something like that. Um, and then I, I had a camera that was a Canon 550D. That was a pretty old one, uh, which was better. So I started using that one. And then I upgraded to a uh, Canon 7D Mark II, I think was the first kind of like, you know, proper camera that I had Um, and then you know since then I've just you know been upgrading like right now I use mostly my 5D Mark IV or a G7X Mark II um, if I have to travel light no I've never used my phone Uh, well I I have a couple of times but it's like maybe 0.3 percent of the time wow and what's your reasoning for that because I personally only use my phone I hate taking up a DSLR 
Yeah. So for me, it's always because I've never had a good phone up until like maybe a year and a half ago or something like that. I've always found the the quality not to be good enough. And for some reason, I've always believed that um, the quality was, you know, something that people really uh, kind of valued in my videos, which and at the end of the day, it's not true at all. When I stopped making all those drone, like actual cinematic drone shots and, and cool editing, no one really cared. <laughs> but I always believed, you know, uh, you know, growing up or uh, being in film school, I always, uh, I took a lot of pride in, in, you know, trying to make things as polished as possible. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. Phone is always, uh, it's always a very convenient way of doing things. And it's good enough quality. Like nowadays, it's amazing the kind of footage you can get from a from a regular phone. So there is no reason why you know people shouldn't use their phone if they, at least if they have an excuse of not having good enough equipment. You know, you just that excuse is removed now because your phone is shooting you know high definition footage at all times. So I want to I want to I want to just challenge you here for a second. I don't know if you're taking over yeah. the challenge, but your next vlog <laughs> you make, use your phone, upload it, see if anyone says anything. Yeah, <laughs> sure, sure. I, I might I, do that. I doubt anyone's going to, now a single comment will be about, what, what, are you got a new phone? Or, I mean, they, yeah. <laughs> or they might say, oh, did you get a new camera? But they won't say, are you using your phone? Like, they won't. Yeah. No, 100%. Um, and, and that is part of the reason why I kind of uh, stopped filming so much with my 5D Mark IV. And I bought a G7X, which is kind of pocket size. Oh, yeah. And now I, I use that a lot more as well. So um yeah but you know going to a phone will be yeah <laughs> i'm gonna try i'm gonna try one blog to see what happens <laughs> um but uh yeah I, I don't think anyone will notice like you're saying i think it's it's more than good enough for sure cool now a uh, couple questions with with your um with your with your workflow again um how often do you think someone should be putting out youtube videos how often do you put out youtube videos and same question for instagram yeah cool uh frequency is always extremely important right so this is the thing about kind of like the, the issue with um, listening to people's advice is that it doesn't necessarily apply to your specific situation. So I know people who upload once a month and they do fantastic, right? Or they uh, upload one YouTube video a week or post an Instagram picture once every three days or something like that. And it, it's really hard to know what's going to work for you because, you know, it, it's the algorithm works in mysterious ways. We never know what is in demand. We never know what your potential, uh, you know, skill or unique selling proposition uh, to put in, into business terms is. So it's really hard to kind of follow a general advice. But in general, the more the better, because the more things you produce, the more you can kind of get feedback. And then the more you can adjust your content depending on the feedback that you're getting. Um, and once you find that, you know, content or those types of pictures or captions or stories that people, you know, can relate to, then you can obviously just continue hammering down on those things. But obviously you want to, you want to, you know, still experiment with new things to keep finding new ideas and that kind of stuff. Um, so for me, I had a period of time where a certain thing was working and then it stopped working and then kind of, you know, I had to adjust, right. I had to find other kind of videos to, to make. And same with Instagram. Instagram has always been my biggest struggle in life. I've never found any kind of like way to grow my Instagram account. Like, you know, like in a, in a huge amount, I never had any uh, viral posts or anything like that. Um, so I'm still trying to figure out to this day. So I have, you know, I've, I've like right now for the past year, I think I've posted two to three times every single day to try to figure it out, but still like nothing, but I know I'll get, it's just, Oh, it, it 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 froze for like two seconds one sec it, okay it, it froze when you said you've been posting two times a uh, a day two yeah. times a day yeah, yeah yeah i'll do that again yeah yeah so for the past year i've kind of uh made a commitment to really figure out instagram so i've been posting two to three times every single day uh which is a huge increase in uh content compared to what i did before um, and still no viral videos, no viral posts, anything like that. Um, but again, I do believe that if I keep going, I will find something that sticks. Um, but again, like the more, the better, because then you can kind of adjust and get as much feedback as possible. Um, but at the same time, you know, like even me, like I consider my pages to be, you know, uh, pretty successful. Um, but I see other pages, you know, putting in half the effort or, you know, uploading half the posts and then all of a sudden, they just hit a jackpot and then get a viral post and then they just keep making the same thing and their pages just skyrocket. That hasn't happened for me, 
and it makes me a little pissed off sometimes, <laughs> but uh, I get over it and I realize that, you know, it's, it's just, you know, what happens, like you can't control it. You just have to keep trying, keep uh, pushing uh, different types of content out there, keep experimenting and eventually something will happen. That's amazing, bro. How do you overcome content um, drought or you thinking like, oh, I don't want to put out content now. I don't have any good ideas or you don't feel confident to put out videos. Like, how do you overcome that? How do you like keep cranking out content on YouTube and Instagram consistently, even though when you maybe don't feel like it? Do you have a team that does it for you or do you do it all yourself? Yeah, so that, that's a really good question. So I try to just realize uh, what my purpose for doing all this is right like I have to go back to the why I have to really ask myself why am I doing this am I doing this just for the views for the money or am I doing this for uh, for some other reason that is you know perhaps bigger than myself so for me personally I've always had a very strong reason because um, you know for me it's all about you know it, of course it's about health and helping people and that kind of stuff but for me uh, first and foremost, it's about having as big of an impact on the world as possible in terms of having a positive change in people, uh, you know, sharing compassion, promoting empathy, getting people to become kinder and more compassionate humans and healthy at the same time, right? So that's kind of like been the big kind of driving force for me because it's a lot easier for me to keep going no matter what if I have something that I believe is, you know, much larger than my uh, ambitions of getting a certain number of followers or a certain uh, monthly income or something like that. It's always, those things have never really helped me that much. It's always been, you know, what is a big reason why you're doing this? And I think that is always gonna be helpful for anyone who's wanting to do something big or try to change people or the world. It's always, they always have to have a strong reason to do that. So finding that is extremely important and then Constantly reminding yourself of that, especially through the tough days, is key to push through those hard times. That's amazing, bro. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's so easy to just, like you said, you only want to do what you want to do, but then having that why to drive you forward, it's like the big. Yeah. That's the difference between like anyone who's like sitting in the audience and people in the stadium actually performing at the highest of high heights, right? If yeah. People performing in the stadium, they, they have like strong enough reason why to go through that turmoil um, as often. Yeah. So then they get those moments of glory. Um, yeah, for sure. So, John, do you think that knowing what you know now, how long have you been on YouTube? Uh, well, <laughs> so I, I actually started when I was like 17. Um, so, but I, I quit. So I, I started as a, a comedy skit kind of channel like ages ago. Uh, those videos are n never to be found <laughs> super embarrassing uh, but that's how i started off so like if we if we count those years then like 12 years yeah okay so you've been doing it for 12 years how long are you on instagram about the same no instagram hasn't been around no, for 12 years. Instagram's only been yeah around. instagram i i joined 2012 i think yeah 2012. okay so you've been on youtube for about 12 years and then on instagram for about eight years yeah now, having learned everything you learned over the eight years on social media um mm -hmm. i mean you've been going full-time at it since 2016 right about yeah so you've been full-time yeah. for four years uh no 2014 oh, 2014 okay so you've been going full-time yeah. for six years wow so yeah. do you think now having gone through that for six years you'd be able to to write a game plan down for yourself six years ago and say hey john just do this a hundred percent man <laughs> man I, I would love that like it would make my life so much easier but at the same time i wouldn't go through all the hardship and all those you know emotional right. kind of turmoils that are life lessons that are much more yeah. valuable than any information i could give anyway so but yeah absolutely i i could have done so much better in so many ways <laughs> <laughs> and do you see people now making the same mistakes that you made when you were starting out yeah for sure uh i think uh, the, the most common mistake is just, uh, you know, procrastinating. It's just not getting started, not putting your full effort into it, right? They, people keep, you know, DMing me, asking me, you know, how do I start my own thing? How do I do this? And I always reply the same thing. It's just, just start today. Like, that's it. Start today and just don't stop. That, it's, it's that simple. Like, it doesn't mean that you're going to succeed straight away, but the present is the only thing we got, right? The, the future is in our imagination. The past is behind us. The only thing we got is today. 
And unless you start building that momentum and taking action today, nothing is going to happen. So I think the, the thing that most people struggle with is just the action taking. They just want to procrastinate and, you know, read about everything, but they don't want to take action because obviously that makes things real and people don't want to deal with the, the outcomes of, you know, the actions that they're putting out there and, you know, maybe realize that maybe they, they're, because it's easy for people to say, oh, I can do that. I can do that. But, you know, once they start and fail because failure is part of everything, they realize that it's not as easy as they think it is and you know people don't want to go through pain and pain is necessary unfortunately yeah I, and 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 you made a point too in one of your videos where you said how uh you did a stat check and over the past year i think it was 96 percent of the people that bought your programs never actually took the action and and, you, and or, or they, they never actually you know stayed through the whole program which is eight weeks right so okay. um you know obviously most i guess most of them would you know do a day or two or a week or something mm -hmm. like that but uh people don't have the discipline to stick to something for you know two months it's right. you know most people just just don't do that and so but you did right you had that discipline you, i mean and you kind of forced yourself to as well you know you quit your job and you took that leap of faith and you're like yeah i'm all yeah. in you went all in and you you had to do it you almost had a gun to your head otherwise you go back to working a job that you hated right yeah so, no i had a imaginary like this is something that i used to uh in my old videos i would say to people like you know I am actually pretending that if I don't do this, if I don't give my all, that I'm actually going to die and that my family's going to die and everything like that. I was actually saying, you know, explaining to people my mindset around me, you know, and actually that's how I started building an audience because people could relate to um, me starting from the bottom and then me sharing all the kind of struggles and that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's an interesting point. I was really pretending that I had a gun to my head and I had to force myself through all that stuff for sure. A hundred percent. That's awesome, dude. One of the biggest uh, hacks for me, maybe if you have a hack to share as well, one of the biggest productivity mm -hmm. hacks for me, when I'm going through like a time where I'm not, I'm not really clear, I'm not really getting much done, what I do is I lock my phone in a lockbox. I have a time lockbox. I lock my phone in there, I lock my keys in there, I lock my wallet in there. So I can't leave the house. I'm home alone. I, I, take the I pl unplug the internet cord and I put it in the box as well, lock it up. So I have nothing yeah. to do but like sit and stare at like paper and a pen and I just like, I'm so bored. I have to write some really cool ideas. Again. When I come up with a really good idea, I'm like, boom, I guess the summit was born. This summit came yeah. out, out of what I call a dopamine fast. Right? That's like, awesome. Hey, we'll, do you for a summit. we'll do this. Right. And so then here we are. Um, what, what hack would you have to get people to like, bam, overcome that procrastination? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, I, I think what it comes down to for me, what I really tell people is, knowing yourself is the most important thing you have to know what you want out of your life you have to know yourself yeah you and most people they don't know themselves at all they just you know they're distracted by everyday media and tv they don't know what they're about they don't know what their deepest values are so first and foremost you have to figure out who you are you have to know what your deepest values are and what you're living your life for instead of just being a zombie and just you know cruising through life without any purpose you have to find that and once you find that then i think that you know things become a lot easier because you know, without an actual deep reason to do something, you're not going to find a, a kind of, uh, you're not going to come up with a game plan or anything like that. So first is just knowing yourself, knowing who you are, and that might change in the future. Don't judge yourself if, if you find out that you're a piece of shit. It's okay. It happens to everyone. But uh, just, you know, try to meditate, try to do, you know, breath work, whatever works, like, you know, locking your, your phone. Uh, and, and what you did is, is amazing. Um, what I do personally is uh i i have started uh, meditating a lot more so like i would again i just listen to uh a, a thunderstorm <laughs> i don't know why a thunderstorm because it's chaotic and i'll just sit in quiet and, until uh my mood is better and i feel like i have you know more energy and uh you know a lot of times new ideas will come into into my head when i do uh, meditation that kind of stuff so um yeah i can't do what you do i wish i could uh, but I have a kid and a wife now, so like it's it's gonna be hard to lock them away in a box as well. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's another thing too, though. Like a lo that's like the one of the biggest excuses for a lot of people. And I know excuses are kind of like they don't really hold much weight, right? I'm sure you as you would know, like you came up from nothing and you had all the excuses in the world, but you're like, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna look at those excuses. I'm just gonna. I didn't mean you have excuses in the world. You had the uh, potential to use excuses to prevent your growth, but you didn't. You're like, I'm gonna blast through those. And there are people watching maybe 
or they know somebody's watching and they're like, wow, like so-and-so says they're not going to do it because they have a kid, they have a wife, they can't afford to, you know, focus on their YouTube, focus on their Instagram. But, yeah. um, you know, at the time you started, you didn't have a kid, right? But you had a girlfriend who, and who's now, who's now your wife. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. That's amazing. So, so cool. So um, what would be your final piece, last question, the interview, final piece of advice for someone who already has a kid, already has a wife, already has a or husband, already has a family and they want to get started um, creating an online YouTube channel for themselves. Yeah, I would say that these people are at an advantage because they've lived life more than these kids who are just, you know, making videos out of their dorms in, in college or something. If you have life experience, if you have struggle, if you have pain, that makes for relatable content. And a lot of people can, you know, relate to you when you, when like it's real life stuff. That was, that's what people want to, want to you know know they want to know you what you've been going through and you know how you've overcome certain things people want to connect to the human behind the camera like information is great and everything but when it comes to actual impact it, it, it's about like really connecting and speaking your truth in an authentic way and sharing the, the vulnerable stuff that uh, you go through in life and that's how you build that bond with your audience so i would say like you know obviously it's it's harder in terms of time management for sure but at the end of the day, we all have 24 hours in a day. What we choose to do with them is up to you. It's all about prioritizing. Uh, you have created the kind of situation and manifested the situation that you currently find yourself in yourself. No one else is to, br to blame, not your wife, your kids, or your job or anything like that. You are accountable and you can make any change that you want as long as you decide to do it and you prioritize what you want to do in your life. So um, I would say people are actually at an advantage if they have I love, kids. I love that energy. answer, dude. That's such yeah. a good answer for people to say, oh, I'm too old. And you say, boom, like you have life experience. That's gold, right? Yeah, and 100%. Like you said, we all have 24 hours in a day. So that's what we prioritize. And so what we're going to get into now is how people can prioritize the next 30 days of their life. How they can <laughs> prioritize day one, two, three, all the way to day 30 to maximize the results they get to fast forward the results to, to to look back at you when you were you know six years ago and say john here's a 30-day game plan forget all the other stuff you did just do the stuff that works yeah so I'm really excited for this 30-day plan it's going to help people um grow their instagram grow their youtube and start selling online coaching and meal plans like you do so really really excited for this and uh let's get into it thank you very much very much john and uh hope, hope to meet you in real life one day this is the first time we've ever interacted so yeah, it's true, man. Yeah, it feels like I've like because I've watched your videos before, so it feels like we've talked before. But yeah, you're right. This is the first time. <laughs> That's pretty funny. I mean, I, all I can say is I've tried everything, and I know that this is. I, I just can't see anything that is more powerful. I really don't. If not, I would I, like I would have said something else. But like, this is the thing for me. Like, a hundred percent. Yeah, it's gold. And I just want to give a big thank you to our sponsor, Canada Vegan Fest, for bringing together hundreds of vegans every summer in Canada from all around the world. See you there at canadaveganfest.ca.